Lord, we do now come to you as a, as a family here, Lord, a family here at the chapel, and we're, we're waiting to hear from you, Lord. We need to hear your voice. Feed our souls, we pray, on the bread from heaven of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So tur- please turn your Bibles to Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. We continue in this wonderful book of Daniel and see what the Lord has for us. We're going to be covering this morning co- two verses, Daniel chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. And, and uh, so let me kind of find that. Dan- Daniel chapter 2, 24. Verses 7. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. Now, uh, the the background of this is that Daniel has been rounded up. He's supposed to be killed with all the wise men in Babylon because they were not able to do what the king had asked them to do, which was to tell a dream that the king had had and had forgotten, and then to give the interpretation of this forgotten dream. I mean, when this happened... Daniel was not even a part of the group that was called in for the king to reveal his dream. But just because Daniel was part of this group called the wise men of Babylon, he was included in the ones that the king had, had said, okay, they all, they all got to be killed. And then we, w- w- what happened here was that by the grace of God, because the king liked Daniel, the king liked to be with him, Daniel was given what the others uh, 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 dream interpreters were not given. Daniel was given time to be able to discover what the forgotten dream was. And during this time, Daniel called his friends together, and he didn't say to them, let's try to figure out what the dream was. Let's just put our heads together. Let's give it our best shot. What do you think? Let's brainstorm. He didn't say that at all. What happened was that he had a short amount of time and that, that, that the king had given him to discover the dream. And so he calls his companions together for one purpose, and that was that they might pray. They might pray, get right down to the issue. When they prayed, they prayed a prayer that said that they deserved nothing from God, and they begged God to show mercies to them. And that was what happened in the middle of the night. Daniel had a vision, and in the vision, Daniel saw the dream that the king had dreamed. And Daniel not only saw the dream, but he saw the, 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 the interpretation of that dream. And then what happened in this chapter is that Daniel then stops and he just takes time just to praise God. He praised God, and that's devoting five verses in this chapter, verses 19 through 23, in which Daniel is very specific on praising God. And in essence, he, 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 he was, in essence, Daniel was saying, I know my life is on the line. I know the life of my companions is on the line. I know the lives of the wise men that I'm a part of the group of, they're on the line. I know how urgent it is to tell the king the dream and the interpretation before we're all killed. But even though that we're about to die, There's something that's more important, it's just more important than immediately stopping now and telling the king his dream. And that something is, we must thank God. I have to thank God. For Daniel, it wasn't just a simple, thank you God for answering my prayer, and then he runs off. No, for Daniel, it was that he took time, and you see this reflected in these five verses here, verses 19 through 23. You see where Daniel took time to compose his prayer of thanksgiving. He took time to cover the themes, to go from one thought to the other, flowing in a cohesive uh, web of, of praise. And we can see that, that, that Daniel didn't just, that just didn't pray off the top of his head. He gave a lot of thought to that. And this is a man of prayer. This is a man of thanksgiving. And we see that in these verses 19 to 23. In fact, when you look now 
at how what it says and how Daniel is now proceeding from thanking God to moving. It starts in verse 24 with the word, therefore. Therefore Daniel went in unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained, or as the word is, appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He goes in, and with this word, therefore, it's almost like Daniel is saying, with this word, therefore, he's saying, okay, now that time has been devoted to thanking God, now that, now that we have adequately praised the Lord for what he's done, now we're ready to go and reveal the dream and the interpretation. And, 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 and just so that we don't miss how tense this is right now, that it's, it identifies this man, Ariok, as the one it says that the man who the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. That's pretty scary. And so Daniel says to this henchman, he says, Ariok, he says for him, don't do it. Don't destroy the wise men because I've got the dream. I've got the interpretation. And Daniel is very brave here. He's not just, he's not, he, he, he's, he's not asking for uh, the company of his friends to be with him. He's just asking for himself. In verse 24, he says, bring me in before the king. And what was amazing was that Ariok trusted Daniel so much that Ariok was willing to put his own life on the line. He was willing to risk his own life for carrying out the king's orders. And we, I mean, we only have to think of last week when this dictator in North Korea, this, this Kim Jong-un, he, he executed five of his staff because the talks with President Trump didn't go the way he wanted it to. So he kills him. So here's Ariok. He's in danger of being killed for not executing the wise men that the king had, had, had said to do. But now, he, but, he, but he now he brings in this Hebrew slave, and, and there's, something, there, 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 there's something, you can't read something like this without realizing that Daniel was a man who won over the heart of Ariok. Daniel was a man who won over the heart of the king. There was something about Daniel, he, there was something about his sweet spirit that made people just want to like him. They wanted to be with him. And in verse 30, 24 here, as Daniel is leaving prayer, he's leaving this praise meeting, and he goes right to Ariok, and his first words to Ariok in verse 24 are, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Daniel here, we see him pleading to save the lives of the wise men of Babylon. And, and we would have thought that Daniel might have come in and says, don't kill me, don't kill my friends, my, my three companions here. Don't, don't, just, don't destroy them, don't destroy me. But Daniel didn't do that. He didn't plead to save his life and the life of his friend. He was interceding for the lives of the wise men. Who were these? Who were these wise men? that Daniel was pleading to save from death. The wise men are identified for us in verse 2, in Daniel 2, verse 2, where it says, Then the king commanded to call, and here's the wise men, the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. So who were these? Who were these wise men? They were the magicians. The magicians that used black magic to call in demons to help them. As workers in black magic, these magicians were the enemies of God. These, these, these wise men that, that Daniel was pleading to save, they were the astrologers. They looked at the stars for messages from the skies. They were, they were not astronomers worshiping the true God who made the stars. These were astrologers who looked for secret messages from the gods speaking to them through the stars. They were like fortune tellers looking for secret messages in the palms of hands. And the astrologers, they were enemies of the true God. Who were these wise men? They were sorcerers. Sorcerers. Oh, no. Sorcerers. Yeah, sorcerers. Por favor. Sorcerers. These were men who cast spells like voodoo on people. These were people who had special relationships with evil spirits. They were demon-possessed. They tried to get others to be demon-possessed. These were the witches who communicated with the dead like in seances. The sorcerers, these were the enemy of God. And these are the, here they all are. Here they are. There's a big group. They're right in front of us now. We've got the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers. They're all the enemies of God. And these are the ones that are called the wise men of Babylon. Not a very nice group. And Daniel steps in. And he pleads in verse 24 
Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Destroy not the magicians, the astrologers, and the sorcerers. Don't kill them. Why? Why in the world would Daniel not want all these wicked men to die? Why in the world did not Daniel not want all these enemies of God to die? Why did Daniel step forward and, and do all he could to save the lives of these evil men? Did Daniel try to save these men so that they could continue to be the enemies of God? Did Daniel try to save them from being killed so that they could continue to practice black magic, astrology, and sorcery? No. God hates the practice of black magic and astrology and sorcery, and Daniel hated that also. But, John 3.16, For God so loved the magician that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever magician believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16, For God so loved the astrologer and the sorcerer that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever astrologer and sorcerer believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. God hates black magic. God hates the black, the black magic, but he loves the magician. He hates astrology, but he loves the astrologer. He hates sorcery, but he loves the sorcerer. God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And Daniel hated the sin, but he loved the sinner. And that's why Daniel said in verse 24, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. That's why the Lord Jesus that's why when the Lord Jesus was asked if, if, if for a city that rejected him and threw him out, if that, that city should be destroyed by fire coming down from the sky, and the Lord Jesus responded in Luke 9.52, Luke 9.52, when he said, it says, and set messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. When the Lord was asked, Is it time now? Is it time to call down fire from heaven to destroy the city that rejects you? The Lord turns on his heels with a very strong rebuke. And he says, I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save them. And when Daniel realized that, he, that he, he did not come to Babylon to see men's lives destroyed, but he came to Babylon to save men. As a matter of fact, when Daniel was asked for the, for the lives of these men to be saved, this shows how Daniel really viewed his, his presence in Babylon. You know, it was real easy for a person like Daniel to get downright depressed about being in Babylon. He would get downright bitter about being a slave in Babylon. It was easy for Daniel to see himself as, I don't deserve this. I'm, I, I don't deserve to be a Jewish slave in a country that hates the Jews. It was easy for Daniel to spend his life wishing that he could be back in his homeland, back in Israel, back in the land, with his own people. Instead of being in this heathen country with astrologers, magicians, and sorcerers, and uh, worshipers of devils. And if Daniel would have felt that way, there's no way that he would have asked to save the lives of the wise men of Babylon. He, the fact that he did care about them, he cared about these men. He didn't, he didn't want them to die. It shows that Daniel saw himself in Babylon not as a victim that was captured and put into slavery, but Daniel saw himself as a man who was sent by God into Babylon to save the Babylonians. We could just imagine Daniel walking in, this, in Babylon saying to himself, I've been sent to this lost people. God has brought me here to people so that I can bring them out of the darkness of ma magic and sorcery and astrology into the light, the marvelous light of the true God, the God of Israel. In essence, Daniel was asking the wise men to be saved. When he was asking that, Daniel could have just spoken the words of 2 Corinthians 5.20. 2 Corinthians 5.20, he could have said, now then, I am an ambassador for Christ, as though God did beseech you by me. I pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. He's a representative of God, of the same God, the same Jehovah Jesus who said in John 10.10, 10, John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more 
abundantly. What a refreshing view that God has brought to us in, this, in, 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 this, this, in, in Daniel's love for the very people who were spreading lies, the very people who were driving people away from God. And there's Daniel praying for his enemies to not be destroyed. Daniel's trying to win these lost souls, these wise men of Babylon, to God. And you can't win them if they're dead. And so he's working for them to be saved from physical death. And more importantly, he's working to save them from eternal death. And he looks forward to being able to look at these wise men and to say the words of 1 Corinthians 6, 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, he was longing to be able to say to them, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. And he could add, nor magicians, nor astrologers, nor sorcerers shall inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified by the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of our God. And so that's why Daniel comes in verse 24 and he says, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king. Such an astounding statement. Destroy not, bring me. Destroy not, bring me. You can't read those words, destroy not, bring me, without seeing those words, the greater Lord Jesus Christ, who in essence said, destroy not, bring me. And that's in essence the statement that the Lord Jesus made with his life is death. Just as the wise men were the enemies of God, we were enemies of God. That's what the Bible says in Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8, it says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet enemies, were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled will be saved by his life. Colossians 1.20, Colossians 1.20 says, The Lord Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. And so these wise men of Babylon were the enemies of God. We were the enemies of God. And just as Daniel offered himself to be brought into the king to save the wise men, so the Lord Jesus offered himself to, in our place to save us, as it says in Romans 5, 6. Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man, Will one die? Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this is the big question that Isaiah 53 answers. The big question is, why? That's the answer in Isaiah 53. Why did the Lord Jesus die that horrible death? And the answer is, Isaiah 53, 5, we have already been singing it. He was wounded for our transgressions, Isaiah 53, 5. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the Lord Jesus said, in John 15, 13, John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It was love that drew the Lord Jesus to say, it was love that Lord to, to, to say, destroy not, bring me. Just like Daniel said in verse 24. When Daniel said that, he was in essence taking ownership. He was taking ownership for these wise men of Babylon. You know, uh, uh, um, recently a friend of mine, wealthy friend, he asked me what he could do with his life and money to bring the lost to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought about it, and I suggested to him that he get a map. He get a map and mark on that map his house in the center. And then that he take a pen and draw a circle on that map around his house with his house in the center. And I says, you decide how big your circle should be. 
And then I told him, I said, you look at every home in the center of that circle and you say, God has made me responsible for the lost souls within this circle. I'm going to pray for each person who lives in this circle. I'm going to make it my business to build a relationship with everyone within that circle. I'm going to look for opportunities to bring the gospel to everyone within that circle. In essence, I suggested that he take responsibility for those people to bring them to God, and he look at everyone within, those cir- within that circle and say, those souls are mine. I will do all I can do to bring them out of the darkness of not knowing the Lord Jesus Christ into the light of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as both their Savior and their God. And this is what Daniel was doing when he's saying, destroy not the wise man, he's taking ownership for him. What an exciting project for a family, for a father to draw that circle on a map and lead his family to take responsibility for the souls within that circle and lead his family to see those lost souls in those circle as those are our souls and we are going to work to bring those people to God. That would be transforming for a family to not just see life as, well, you know, here we are on this street and we just make our home as comfortable as we can for ourselves. You know, one of the, one of the most best-selling books you know had the title of The Purpose Driven Life. And the reason it sold so many copies, I think, is because of its title. I never read the book, but I like the title. Because the title resonates. It resonates so loudly with people because people look at their lives and they say, the title of my life is The Purpose Void Life. People feel that their lives have no real eternal purpose. They live, they work to survive, to get by, to provide money for them, food for themselves, shelter, and that's what it's all about. And, but deep down in the heart, there is this gnawing emptiness that troubles the soul, and it's the gnawing emptiness of, of, of Dion Warwick's song. You know, what's it all about, Alfie? What's it all about, Alfie? Is it just for the moment we live? What's it all about when you sort it all out, Alfie? Are we meant to take more than we give? As sure as there's a heaven above, Alfie, I know there's something much more. What's it all about, Alfie? It's all about heaven. It's all about the possibly possibility to go there by believing into the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about hell and changing the course that leads to hell. It's all about dying to self-interest and living to the interests of the Lord Jesus Christ who said his interests were, Luke 19.10, Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's his interests. It's all about focusing on the lost and making our lives as laser-directed as an Exerset missile that focuses on its target. That's what the word seek means in Luke 19, 10. It means to focus in on the lost as an Exerset missile. Exerset missile is interesting. It was developed by the French back in the 60s. The word Exerset is a French word. It means flying fish. And just like a flying fish leaves its water, like the fish out of its water, leaves its water to seek its target, that's what God wants us to, 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 to be as believers. The exercet mentality, where we leave our comfort zone, we leave our water, the water of our comfort zone, comfort zone to focus with laser accuracy on our target. Our target is the lost in Luke 19.10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Our focus is to see the lost saved. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the purpose-filled life. That's the purpose-filled family. It looks at a map before them. It looks at a circle on a map, and it views themselves. It says, this family has come into this neighborhood to seek and to save that which is lost. And that's how Daniel saw himself in Babylon, where Daniel, in essence, would say, some people might look at me and say, poor boy, dragged from his home in Israel like a fish out of water in a foreign land of Babylon. How sad. But Daniel would say, no, I choose to see myself as brought by God to Babylon. I choose to see myself as sent by God into Babylon to seek and to save that which is lost. Daniel could say, I took a map 
with my location in the center. I drew a circle around my location. What was in my circle? The wise men of Babylon. Yes, the magicians were there. The astrologers were there. The sorcerers were there. They're all in that circle there. And I said to God, I accept responsibility for these people in the sphere in which I live and work. I will give myself to seek and to save the lost magicians, astrologers, the lost sorcerers. I'll pray for them. I'll speak to them about the true God. I will love them. They are the enemies of God, but I will love them. They are mine. I claim them for God. So please, Ariok, verse 24, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Destroy them not because they're not ready to die. They don't know the great God and Savior, Jehovah Jesus. They will come to know the Him, or my heart will be broken. My name is Daniel, and this is my life to bring them to God. And by saying that, Daniel was taking ownership of them. And this is the same ownership that the Lord Jesus took for the lost when the Lord Jesus took a map. He took a map where he was in Israel, and he drew a big circle around that. And he said, these souls are mine. I will bring the lost in this circle to God, or my heart will be broken. And the lost souls in the circle the Lord Jesus drew first was Israel. When it says in Matthew 15, 24, Matthew 15, 24, he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But his circle did not only have Israel in it. He talked about the lost souls that were also outside that immediate circle of Israel within his circle when he said in John 10, 16, John 10, 16, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, not in this circle, them also I must bring. Other sheep I have, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. When the Lord Jesus said that, he had that, that he, when he said that he had these other sheep that were his, they weren't of the Jewish fold. He was speaking of the Gentile sheep that were also in his circle. Because the circle that the Lord Jesus drew for his responsibility was larger than Israel. And he said how large his circle was when he told his followers in Mark 16, 15. Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The circle of the Lord Jesus was the whole world. The circle of the Lord Jesus included Acts 1, 8. Acts 1, 8. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, circle one, Judea, wider circle, Samaria, bigger circle, and unto the uttermost part of the earth includes the whole earth. The circle that the Lord Jesus drew included the uttermost part of the earth. It included Eskimos in the Arctic, natives in Indonesia, Japanese in Kyushu, pygmies in the Congo, Russians in Siberia, Peruvians in Lima, Loretanos in Loreto, and families that live within one mile of your home. They're all included in the circle that the Lord Jesus drew for the souls that he made himself responsible for. And then he turns to us, and he says to us, if I can draw a circle that includes the whole world and take responsibility to bring the lost souls within that circle to the safety of God, can't you draw a circle of just one mile around your home? Can't you take responsibility to bring the lost souls to those the, within that circle to the safety of God? And this is what Daniel did when he said in verse 24, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. And just as Daniel was taking responsibility to bring those lost magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers to the safety of God, so the Lord Jesus took responsibility for the whole world when he said in John 10, 16, other sheep I have which are not this fold. He said the other sheep, he had, he had the Jewish sheep, he had the Gentile sheep. That means he had Jewish lost sheep, which he called the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he had saved sheep of the house of Israel. Whether they were lost or saved, they were his sheep. He labored for the lost sheep of the house of Israel to become the saved sheep of the house of Israel. And when they, and when they did not, that broke his heart. That broke his heart. He cried for them. In Luke 19.41, Luke 19.41, where it says, When he was come near, he beheld the city of Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. 
For the days shall come upon thee that your enemies shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round about, keep thee in. Matthew 23, 37, Matthew 23, 37. His heart is broken for his lost sheep of the house of Israel as he cries out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. The Lord wept over them because they were his lost sheep. They were his lost sheep of the house of Israel. And because the circle was wide, the Lord Jesus also had lost Gentile sheep. And he had saved Gentile sheep. And that's the reason the Lord Jesus could look at the Roman soldier who, drew, who was driving the nails into his hand. And he could say, he is one of my lost Gentile sheep. And I care deeply for this one of my lost Gentile Roman sheep. And that's the reason why the Lord Jesus could look down from the cross as he's dying from blood loss. He's dying from dehydration. He sees those Roman soldiers gambling for his clothes. And he says, they are my lost Gentile Roman sheep. I care deeply for them as my sheep. I will pray for them. Luke 23, 34. Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. The Lord Jesus saw all the world as his sheep. He cared for them. He wanted them to be forgiven for their sins. And, and the Lord Jesus could have said, he, he, he could say, I gave my life for my lost sheep to be saved from their sins. He could say that. I'm giving my life for my lost sheep to be saved from their sins. My name is Jesus. That's who he was. And that was Daniel. And Daniel could say, I give my life for my lost Babylonian magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers to be saved from their sins. My name is Daniel. And then we have this dramatic scene of Daniel now coming into the king's presence in verse 25, where it says, Then, or, then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captains of Judah who will make known unto the king the interpretation. And we can see so much in this scene in verse 25, as Daniel's being brought into the presence of the king. Because there's the king, and the king is very angry. And the king has already ordered the destruction of the wise men. And there's Daniel who's saying, destroy not the wise men. And now there stands Daniel, and Daniel is standing there all alone. And we can imagine how Ariok might have announced that Daniel is the person who can tell the dream. And then we can imagine how Dan Ariok no sooner tells, here's Daniel, and then Ariok just kind of backs off and says, you're on your own, pal. And, and Daniel is standing there all alone. He doesn't have his three companions there with him at this point. He's standing there all alone. He's alone. He's all alone. He's very alone. And he's standing before the king. And it's that scene of Daniel staring, standing there all alone before an angry king who's already given the orders to destroy all the wise men. And Daniel is standing there all alone, and he's, only, and he's saying, destroy not the wise men. Destroy not the wise men. This is the scene that illustrates so much for us. Because just as the king was angry with all those wise men and had ordered the destruction of the wise men, so God the Father was angry with man and had ordered for all men to be destroyed in hell as it is written in Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.19, Romans 3.19, all the world becomes guilty before God. Romans 11.32, Romans 11.32, God hath concluded them all in unbelief. 1 Kings 8, 46, 1 Kings 8, 46, If they sin against thee, there is not a man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them. Galatians 3, 22, Galatians 3, 22, The scripture hath concluded all under sin. And the problem is, the problem is that sin is not really an oh well, who cares affair. Sin is not really an oh well, there's no problem, the rest of the, everybody else is a sinner. No, sin is Romans 6, 23. Sin is Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. Sin is Isaiah 3.11. Isaiah 3.11. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. Sin is Ezekiel 18.20. Ezekiel 18.20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Sin is Revelation 21.8. Revelation 21.8. The fearful, unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, all have their part 
in the lake of fire, which burneth with brimstone of fire. That's the second death. And just as with the, when Daniel is standing there before the king, Daniel is standing before an angry king who has ordered the destruction of the wise men. Sin is so personal for us. Sin is a personal offense against God the Father, and he's angry. And he's already ordered the personal destruction of all sinners to be cast into hell for eternity. That's who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He's standing before an angry God the Father who has already determined that the destruction of all men because of their sins. The sad truth came home for me on uh, last Friday when, when I, 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 I was telling a man named Hector, I stated the Bible says that there's two roads. One, the Lord Jesus says there's two roads. There's one wide road, many people on it, they're going to hell. There's one narrow road, just a few people on it, they're going to heaven. I asked him, which road are you on? He stops and looks me in the face and he says, I'm on the wide road going to hell. Very sad. Very sad. But good news is that there's one who said, I died for the sins of man to destroy them from hell. Destroy them not. My name is Jesus. Just as Daniel was standing there all alone before the king, there was the Lord Jesus all alone who stood before God the Father. He says, I, and he's saying, I am I dying for the sins of man so that they don't have to be destroyed. And just as he was all alone on the part of the Lord Jesus, we see Daniel there standing all alone. And it's this all alone part of the Lord Jesus as he stands before God the Father that's illustrated by the holy priest or the high priest, by the high priest as he enters into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur. The high priest is all alone. And he's illustrating when he's all alone in the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Holies, he's illustrating Hebrews 9.12. Hebrews 9.12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, Jesus, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. When the Lord Jesus entered in before God the Father, his plea was destroy not. He was all alone. And he had in his hand, the only thing he had in his hands, the only thing he had in his hands to offer God for our salvation was nothing except his own blood. As it says in Hebrews 9.12, Hebrews 9.12, by his own blood, he entered. So now, as we come to the Lord's table now, let's think of Daniel, verse 24, who said, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. And as we think of Daniel pleading for the lives of those wise men in Babylon, let's appreciate what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's make it a point to give ourselves, dedicate ourselves, pray for our lost friends who do not have this friendship with God. Let's say, destroy not the wise men. My name is Daniel. Let's pray. Father, as we come now to your table, we pray, Lord, that you would give us a heart, a broken heart for our lost friends, that you would not destroy them. In Jesus' name, amen.